Now, let's look at this again, Malachi chapter 3. Praise God for the Word. Aren't you thankful for the Word? God's Word. Amazing. Now, here's the promise. Here's the, here's the, the, the challenge, if you will. Let's just read it again. Verse 10, Malachi chapter 3. He said, Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. So see, God gives you purpose in this. There is a cause. It is, it is the tithe that enables God's work, or at least partially enables God's work to go on. That there may be meat in my house. So we have a purpose in our giving. It's not, it's not to get rich. Now there's nothing wrong with getting rich, nothing wrong with being rich. If there was, Jesus wouldn't have made you rich. But the fact is, it says he, he became poor so that you through his poverty might be rich. So there's nothing wrong with being rich. But again, you're not get, giving to get. You don't have to get. You're not a getter. You're a producer. And that's a very important distinction. Deuteronomy 8.18, I've shared this with you before, says, But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God. For it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, as he swear unto their fa uh, the fathers as it is this day. So it tells us there that God, in Deuteronomy 8.18, it's covenant based. He swore to the fathers, established his covenant. He gives us the power. But I always like to correct this. The word get in the, the that the, you know, the, the, well, the Hebrew word that get in the King James Bible is translated from doesn't mean get like we think today. I don't know about you, but it seems like there's a lot of people out there that are looking for some, some way to get something. You know, they want to get something for nothing. They want to get what you've got. They want to get a check from the government. They just want to, they want to get, and, and, and so the mentality, I, I make this distinction because I don't want anybody to, to become get minded. A better translation of the Hebrew word is, it is God that gives the power to produce to produce. You're not a getter, you're a producer. Amen. Now produce is what you buy in the store. And, it, 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 and produce is the section where you buy the stuff that grows from seed. Yeah. Yeah. And so once again, even in that word produce, we see the principle of sowing and reaping in seed time and harvest, yeah. you see? And so you're not a getter, you're a producer, all right? I'm a producer. My life, as I live and as I walk and as I interact with humanity, of course with the Lord, but with the rest of humanity, produces good for the world. The world is a better place because you and I are in it. You see what I'm saying? I said the world is a better place because you and I are in it. The world would not be quite as good, quite as sweet, quite as rich if you weren't here. That's right. Or if I weren't here. Amen. They can't say that about everybody. But we can say it about you. Because you're a child of God, walking in the light, walking in the fullness of, of God's spirit and the knowledge of his word. And as a result, you're a producer. Amen. You don't take from this world, you add to this world. That's my point. And so because of that, we have every right to expect harvest, benefits, blessings, wealth, and so on and so forth. But once again, this is a study in Bible economics. And Bible, biblical economics is different than non-biblical economics. There's, there's a lot of distinctions. One of them, of course, is that we produce, not that we get, not that we try to finagle, not that, we, not that we're basing it on some kind of a lucky break or some kind of a windfall. You know, I know that there are people out there that think, man, I tell you, if I just, you know, I heard about this one got that and this one did that, and man, I wish I had a rich relative who would leave me a fortune when they die. You did. You did. His name was Jesus. 
He was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor that you might be rich. And you have an inheritance in him. And that spiritual inheritance will produce wealth. Are you listening to me? Amen. And so, prove me now herewith, saith the Lord, bring you all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. We talked last week a little bit about the windows of heaven. And about that which comes out of heaven, in the sixth chapter, came out of heaven, rain, uh, in the sixth chapter of Genesis, prevailed over the earth, prevailed over what was down here natural. It prevailed over the evil, but it prevailed over everything. And I like to say that today. I like to use that, that coinage of phrase. What comes out of heaven prevails over whatever's going on here. May be trouble here, but what comes out of heaven is going to prevail over it. May be drought here, but what comes out of heaven is going to prevail over it. May be need here, but what comes out of heaven is going to prevail over it. I will open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. And he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. Now once again, if you didn't write this down, make note of this. Tithing protects your harvest. Amen. You can plant a seed and still not have a harvest. But as a tither, he, one of the promises here is that it protects your harvest. Now you understand this. If you don't tithe, it's not God stealing your harvest. It's the devourer that steals your harvest. But tithing is one of those things that God implemented in his interaction with Abraham. Had nothing to do with the law. Had to do with the Abrahamic covenant. And it was one of those things that God received from Abraham and in turn empowered it. And you know he's God. He can do that if he wants to. And somebody not believing it doesn't change the fact that the Bible is true. He shall not destroy, that, uh, that is the devourer, I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. He shall not destroy the fruit of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. Well, that means that, you know, I've had, I've had uh, again, I planted this garden this year, and I'm watching the garden, even as I'm teaching the word, and I'm drawing illustration from it. We've got a, a plant or two that I went out there, I don't know, couple of weeks ago and all the other plants are green and, and bushy and uh, you know things are growing like they should but this one there were no leaves on it that wasn't dead from the roots because it's green but the leaves were gone and then I'd, I'd noticed that it, it like it was a jalapeno pepper plant and the, and the peppers uh, the next day were laying on the ground now I never did find what did that it's like a, a, a caterpillar or a worm must have got in that plant and eaten it. But something caused that, those, those peppers to drop before their time. Well, in the spiritual realm, in the, in the realm of life, that's, a, that's a, an allegory, if you will, or a, a, an illustration that, that shows things like that can happen in life. But tithing prevent, protects that, protects the fruit, protects the, the harvest from the seed that you've sown and keeps it from being devoured by invisible enemies. Keeps it from, from casting its fruit before the time. You know, a lot of, a lot of things will drop off the, the, the limb when they're ripe, but they're not supposed to fall off before they're ripe. See? And I've seen plants in my own garden that it fell off before it was ripe, before it was ready. Something was attacking it. You see? And like I said, even now, I don't know what it was. I've gone out there and I've, I've searched every inch of that plant. What was that that did that? And sometimes things happen. You don't know. But here's the thing about it. When you, when you do this, when you're operating in this function with God, this covenant interaction with God, and that's what it is. It's just a covenant interaction. When you're doing this, you're protected from things that you don't even know came at you. I'm so totally satisfied that when we get to heaven, we're going to get to see reruns. 
and it'll be like the road runner and the coyote. And you remember the, any of y'all old enough to remember, I know most of y'all old enough in this crowd to remember the road runner cartoons. And the road runner just beep beep running down the road. And while E. Coyote was always scheming on him, trying to drop an Acme anvil on him from the cliff, or shoot an Acme rocket at him from a hidden position, and, and these things would just, you know, he'd run past it and they'd, you know, miss him. And a lot of times the rocket would spin around and come back and hit the coyote. And I'm satisfied that there's going to be, now we, we look at, the, at the, the things where sometimes it doesn't turn out like we want and we wonder what happened. But I'll guarantee, I mean, I'll bet you dollars to donut holes that when we get to heaven, we'll get to see instant replays of thousands of things that should have taken us out and should have taken us down and should have messed us up that we didn't even know happened. Because we're walking in, I'll rebuke the devourer for your sakes and he'll not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. And the next verse, verse 12, and all nations shall call you blessed for you shall be a delightsome man, saith the Lord of hosts. Then in verse 13, he tells us how it's important that we connect our words with our giving. You can't give right and talk wrong and expect the fullness of it to come to pass. You can't talk right and not act on this and expect it to operate as fully. And in neither case is it God doing it to you. What God has given us here is a weapon to wage war and be victorious in this life. All right? Can you say amen? And then finally, I'll call to your attention three times in this passage that we just read. Well, we, uh, if we go down to verse 14 and finish what he, the thought that he said about your words being stout against me and how you have said the wrong things, we find four times, once in verse 10, once in verse 11, once in verse 12, and once in verse 14. Four times we find the phrase, saith or uh, before the Lord of hosts. And once again, for those of you that know this, but we need to be reminded of it, the Lord of hosts, translated from the Hebrew, which literally means the captain of the heavenly armies. In other words, what he's talking about here is the angelic force. When we do this, we are activating the invisible armies of God. Amen. Remember Jesus, as we studied Melchizedek, Jesus is our high priest after the order of Melchizedek, and he is the Lord of Sabaoth. He is the captain of the armies of the Lord. That is the captain or the commander in chief, if you will, of the angelic armies. And here we see that this interaction with God in faith activates not only the blessing of heaven that is on us through Jesus Christ, but it also motivates the angelic armies. And all of us have angels. And we've had them ever since we were born. Jesus talked about the guardian angels of children. Nowhere does it say that you lose that when you grow up. Matter of fact, I think you get more because you need more. <laughs> I mean, a kid can get in trouble, but a grown-up can get in a lot of trouble, you know? And so the, the, the captain of the Lord of Armies in this passage of Scripture tells us, reminds us, that our giving activates God's blessing and it motivates the ministering spirits of heaven. So it's incumbent upon us to operate in this intentionally and to make our confession line up with and agree with God's word in this matter. Therefore, I say with boldness, I am a tither yes. and the devourer is rebuked right. for my sake in my life. Yes. I am a tither yes. and the host of heaven are active in my behalf. I am a tither and my fruit does not, you know, it's not compromised. The vine doesn't cast its fruit before the time and the devourer is, is not gonna consume my harvest in Jesus name. I'm a tither. Glory to God. Are you listening to me? Amen. Glory to God. 
Now, um, First Corinthians, I'm mean, sorry, First Kings 17. Flip over there quickly and let's look at something. First Kings chapter 17. Here's another aspect. And, and when, you, when you read Malachi chapter 3, verses 8, 9, or 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, along in there, what, what, you, what you find is God, God's challenge. And that's why we call this a tithe challenge. It's a challenge. Come on. Come on. Now, when Malachi was written, when the prophet Malachi came to the people, the people of Israel were in dire straits. They were in the midst of great problems. Uh, drought, famine, any number of things. You read through the book of Malachi and he talks to them about, you know, this, this is happening and this is going on and you wonder why and here's the answer. And so he, he comes to them with this challenge, with this, come on guys, bring the tithes into the storehouse and prove me now. Can you hear the tone of, of, of the Spirit of God in this? Come on, shake it off. You don't have to live here. Come on. You don't have to, you don't have to, this, this is not something you survive. Come on, I'll show you how to thrive. Glory to God. And in that, concealed in that, if you will, and yet very important, we find a principle here that I want us to look at in 1 uh, Kings 17. Um, in the first verse, we find a man introduced that I have, I have great affinity for. His name is Elijah. And there's just something about Elijah I've always liked. I don't know why. I think one reason I like him is I like his boldness. Another thing I like about him is all we know about him is that he was a Tishbite. Verse 1 says, And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, as the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. Now, the reason that I like that, and the reason that I bring that out, that all we know about him is that he was a Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead, is apparently that's all, no, nothing else mattered. All that we need to know about Elijah is that he said he spoke according to the word of the Lord. That's all I need. James points out the fact in the fifth chapter of James that Elijah was a man like you and I are. And he prayed and the heaven stayed the rain. And then he prayed again earnestly and the heaven brought forth the rain. But it makes the point Elijah was a man. He was not some superhuman. He was not some deity. He was not some one-off, one-of-a-kind he was a man. And in this pattern that we see, here's a guy who just showed up and started speaking for God. That's encouraging to me. His pedigree didn't matter. His ancestry didn't matter. He just shows up and starts speaking for God. That means my pedigree doesn't matter. My ancestry doesn't matter. I can speak for God. I can take God's word and put it to work in my life. I may not be a called a prophet to a nation, but I'm certainly a prophet in my own life. And so are you. You can prophesy your tomorrow. You can speak as a prophet of God over your own life simply by taking the word of God and putting it in your mouth. Jesus showed us this. So simple. The church world struggles with the devil. And they build testimonies to him. Oh, the devil's doing this, and the devil's doing that, and the devil's ruining this. And the de Jesus showed us in the Gospel of Matthew. He went down to the river. He got baptized in water by John the Baptist. Then he got baptized in the Holy Ghost by the Father. And then from there, he was led into the wilderness. And he faced the devil. And three times in a row, he pimp slapped the devil right back down into the hole that he stuck his head up out of with, it is written. He was hungered. Jesus was hungered after this 40-day fast. Oh, if you be the son of God, 
command these stones that they, they be made bread. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone. Everything the devil said, Jesus responded with, it is written. But he said it. It wasn't just enough to be written. He had to say what was written. And when he said it, glory to God, the devil ducked. And then he was stupid enough to put his head up again. And challenge him on this. And Jesus once again said, it is written. And put an end to that temptation. And then the third time, he did it again. And the third time, Jesus responded exactly the same way. It is written. He didn't say, I'm the son of God. How dare you? He didn't say, I created you. You don't, you, you, you don't mess with me. He, said, he spoke to him out of the word, the written word of God to set the pattern for you and me. That if we will resist the devil in the same way that he did, the devil will flee from us. Are you here or not? All right. So Elijah came in and he began to declare for the Lord. God gave him this word and he began to declare it. There were some things that had to be cleaned up in this nation. And there were some things that had to take place. So Elijah called for a drought. Now I don't recommend you do that. Unless the Lord tells you to. And if you do, don't call for a drought at my house, okay? <laughs> Seriously. Jesus, he, God, God has given him this word, and there's some things that have to take place. But even in the midst of this, God took care of him. He sent him to the brook. There he fed him with, you, you know, the rest of the story. But then the time came when it was time for Elijah to move. And this is the part of the story I particularly like. Verse 9. Verse 8, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongs to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. So he arose and went to Zarephath. When he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering of sticks. And he called to her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. All right, now listen. Remember the process here. He called for a drought. He called for the rain to stop. There will be no more rain until I say so. Now the, 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 the cessation of the rain produced a famine. This was not something that happened overnight. This was a long standing, years long process. All right. It took a while to exhaust all the stores and all the, all the crops in the barns and things like that. But now then we're getting down to the, to the dicey part. Things are getting tough out there. All right. So Elijah goes into the city and sees this woman and says, fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. Now I might point out here that the problem started with the cessation of rain. Water is a very valuable commodity. So he asked her for a drink of water. Notice what she did. She immediately started to do what he asked, to fetch the water. And as she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. Once again, he, she's as, he's asking for something very, very valuable. And in this case, it's life and death. And she said, As the Lord God liveth, I have not a cake. All I have is a handful of meal in a barrel. And a little oil in a cruise, and behold, I'm gathering two sticks that I may go in and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said unto her, I note these words, underline this in your Bible. Elijah said unto her, fear not. Everybody say, fear not. For thus saith, uh, uh, sorry, fear not, go and do as thou hast said, but make me thereof a little cake first, and bring it unto me, and after make for thee and for thy son. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, the barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. And she went and did according to the saying of Elijah, and she and he and her house did eat many days. The margin of my Bible says about a year. That's how many days it was. 360 plus days. All right. Now, here's this woman in a long-standing onslaught of no rain, which produced famine. The stores are eaten up, the reserves, all the green beans that she had canned, they're gone. All the, you know, jerky is gone. 
uh, it, it, everything. It, it's gone. She's got a little meal and a little oil. I'm gonna mix it together, make this cake, and then after that, she didn't know what she was gonna do, so she said, I guess this is it. Once we finish it off, there is no more. So that's why she said, we'll eat it and we'll die. You see, she's not just talking negatively. She's not talking unbelief. She's watched her neighbors die. Yeah. She's heard word from other places of the death, the death count rising as a result of this famine. So she's in this place and there's nothing, there's no out. <laughs> there's no, nowhere to go. So Elijah comes to her and his first words to her after asking her to give him this that is so precious in her life. He said, fear not, fear not. Now I've heard people uh, who take a stand or take a position against tithing and say it's no longer something because we're redeemed from the curse. And tithing, you know, particularly when you read the, the scripture about will a man rob God, how that puts fear in you. And God doesn't do that. He doesn't put fear in you about that. There's two different kinds of fear that you need to understand. God is not the God of the kind of fear that terrorizes you. But there's another kind of fear that is better translated respect. R-E-S-P-E-C-T. Find out what it means to he. Are you listening to me? Little Motown there for Francis's uh, benefit over there. No, what Elijah is saying here to this widow woman when he says fear not, he doesn't just say don't fear because he goes right into an alternative. And what was that alternative? In the very next verse, he said, for thus saith the Lord God of Israel. Now he's given her something to weigh against the circumstances. And what he's saying to her is, and what he's saying to all of us is that we all need to recognize in whatever situation we may find ourselves, whatever adversity, whatever circumstantial discomfort that we may find, there's always an option, and this is the option. Which one do you have the most respect for? This woman had immense respect for this famine. So much so that she looked at it and knew that it was her death and the death of her son. But now then the word of the Lord comes. And with this word of the Lord comes the admonition Fear not. But let me phrase it a different way. What Elijah is doing here is giving her an option. Which one will you respect the most? The famine of long-standing duration that you've been living with and watching for a while or this word of God? You see, the Bible tells us that it's the fear of the Lord that is the beginning of knowledge. I read a statistic here recently that it, we're at an all-time low in America for those who believe that the Bible is the Word of God, percentage-wise. I know there's reasons for that, but just take it at face value. If that, in fact, is true, that explains why people have so much fear and respect for the circumstances because it's not being replaced by the fear and respect of God. And you lose the fear of God, anything goes. You lose the fear of God, morality goes out the window. You lose the fear of God, there is no faith. Because if you don't respect what God's Word says, that, I mean, that's the basis of faith. You can't live by faith without respecting God, but the Bible, the, 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 the uh, King James Bible word for that respect is fear. Yes, sir. You don't find it talking about the respect for God's word. You find it saying things like the fear of the Lord is the beginning. But that's not a negative thing. That's right. It's a positive thing. Yes, 
And even in that kind of respectful fear, there's still a little bit of, I don't want to get on the wrong side of this. I didn't fear my dad like I would fear a dog that was chasing me. But I respected him highly and I didn't want to get on the wrong side of it. I didn't want to see him angry. I didn't want to displease him. Are you listening to me? You're the same way. You know what I'm talking about. That's not a bad thing. If I find a, a person that says, oh, I never, you know, I never was afraid of my dad in the sense that I'm talking about, I kind of doubt that. Or if it's true, your dad might have been a wimp. Because most of the dads that I knew, they commanded respect. They weren't brutal. They weren't mean. They weren't, they weren't tyrannical. They were just men who their word was good. If they said, don't do that, then don't do it. And if they said, do it, then you better do it. And of course, we all challenged that. We all challenged our parents and our, our fathers and all that. See what we get away with. <laughs> I remember one time my dad told me, cut the grass. So I went out and cut the grass. You know, we had a power lawnmower. You know, I cut the grass. You know, I didn't want to do it. So I stopped and went inside and started doing whatever I did, watching TV or, or whatever. And Dad came in. He said, I told you to cut that grass. How come, how come you're not, the grass is not cut? I said, well, I, <laughs> I can't believe I said this. I said, that, that lawnmower had so much vibration it was hurting my hands. <laughs> In the, in the handle, you know, push along more. I said, it's vibrating so hard it hurt my hand. He said, boy, get out there and cut that grass. And I knew it was better that my hands hurt than some other part of my anatomy that was now at risk. You know what I'm saying? Now that's not fear, fear, but it's fear, right? I didn't want to cross that line. I knew that was it. I, I tried it, it didn't work. Here we go. Some of y'all laughing and looking like y'all never did anything like that. No, of course not you. I see them halos over your head. <laughs> the fear of the Lord is a good thing. It's a good thing. It's a positive fear because it brings respect. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I don't get some of these people that, that don't have that where God is concerned. I know he loves me. I know he's, he's, he laid, he gave his best for me, but it causes my blood to run cold to think about getting crossways with him. Not that, not that it would be easy to do. Don't misunderstand me. But what I'm saying is when I see other people that defy him, when I see other people that is like in God's face, I think, <clears throat> I wouldn't do that. I just wouldn't do that. I know that God's not going to drop the hammer on them or on me. I know that. And yet there's still that underlying respect that I have for God. I just, I don't know. Are y'all here or not? Let me see if I can find a verse of scripture. I'll ask you what this means. I don't know if I can go right to it or not. It's one of those we don't preach very much. <laughs> right out of the New Testament. <laughs> oh, where is that? Um, the scripture says it is a, it's not fearful. It says it's a, oh, what is that? I'm going to paraphrase it like I, like I think about it. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. You know where that scripture is? Anybody know where that is? Are you looking it up on your, huh? Hebrews 10, of course it's Hebrews 10, 31. <laughs> Hebrews 10, 31. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Let's look at the context. He said, verse 34, we know him that has said, vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. 
It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. All right, now, that doesn't do away with any of the goodness of God, and it certainly doesn't do away with any grace, and it doesn't do away with any mercy, but it shows us that our God is not one to be trifled with. And if you don't have some of that in you, I wonder about you. I wonder about people that have such a, uh, uh, I, I think they would call it freedom to do whatever they wanted to do and not care what God thinks about it. Again, I know under the dispensation of grace, God's not the hammer. He's not the hatchet man. He's not, he's not, the, not the one that gets you. But if he tells you, don't touch that, and you touch it, you're got either way. You see what I'm saying? I don't know why I'm going this way, other than, to, other than just to, to build the case on what I'm talking about, about respect. It's important that you have more respect for the Word of God than it is that you have for anything else. And if you've got a... If you've got a <laughs> you know, you, you don't want to fear God less than you fear the circumstance. You want to have more respect for Him and for His Word than you do anything else. That's where faith arises. That, that's what faith is. Faith is having more respect for God's Word and what He says the outcome will be than it is for anything or anybody else.